Hey everyone, welcome to Mosaic Teens. I'm so glad that you found us and you are joining us today. Um, if you are new and you want to know more about Mosaic Teens, uh, you can find a link to our website in the description. And you can also find a link to get more information about our online discussion groups if you are interested in joining those as well. Um, and today we are continuing our series through the book of Genesis, and we're looking at chapters 16 through 17 today, so two chapters, and we're going to go through most of it, um, but we're going to skip a couple of sections, and we're looking at this idea of what's in a name. In these two chapters, we see a lot of different names and name changing happening, and we're going to be looking at what that means, what it signifies, and what is going on in the, these chapters and the first two names we're going to look at are Ishmael and El Roy. Now, pop quiz for any of you guys. How many of you know who El Roy is? I feel like that is a name most of you have not heard before. If you have heard of it before, let me know how you have heard of it. And if you don't know, give me your best guess. But uh, we're looking at this story and we're going to see the two names of Ishmael and El Roy. And we're starting in Genesis 16, verse 1. It says... Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So if you remember last week and the weeks before, we talked about the promise that God gave to Abram that he will have offspring and that they will be numerous, as numerous as the stars in the sky. And now Sarai is barren. She is unable to have children. And she says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. She's attributing this lack of children to the work of God, saying maybe there's a different way God wants this to work. God is preventing me from having kids, so let's take action in a different way to try and bring about God's plan, but in our own way. And she says, take my servant and be married to her and have a child through her, and that's how we will have offspring. And it says, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And this is interesting, and I highlighted this here because this is the same exact language from the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, where it says that Adam listened to the voice of his wife, of Eve, uh, when she told him to eat of the fruit of the tree that God told them not to eat. Now, the issue here isn't that Abram listened to his wife. The issue here is that this was clearly against God's will and against God's plan. And Abram was responsible for leading and for guiding Sarai, his wife. And he was supposed to show her that this isn't what God wanted and direct her in the way that God wanted. The issue here isn't listening to your wife. That's a good thing that we should all who are married do. But the issue here is the lack of guidance that Abram is giving Sarai here. And we see that this is going to result in a lot of issues. In verse 3, it continues. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So Abram listens to Sarai, his wife. Hagar gets pregnant. She's going to have a child. And now Sarai's upset. She says that her mistress is looking, uh, she is looking on contempt with her mistress, saying that she is jealous of her, that she is having a child, that she now feels that Abram may be favoring Hagar over Sarai because she is going to give him a child. And this all is starting some issues that could have been avoided if Abram was guiding Sarai, his wife, the way he was supposed to. And then in verse 5 and on, it gets even worse. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. 
Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So in the last verse, it told us that Sarai looked on contempt to Hagar, and now Sarai's con- con- um, saying to Abram that Hagar is guilty of doing that to her, that Hagar is looking on contempt with Sarai, and that's not what we see happening. It's Sarai that's looking to Hagar with contempt, looking down on her, and she's mad at Hagar, but she's also mad at Abram that he would allow this to happen. And she says, may the Lord judge between you and me. May God judge you for the sinful thing that has happened. And it is Abram's responsibility to some degree. Yes, Sarai sinned in this suggestion and in following through with it, but Abram was still supposed to lead and guide her, and he failed in that, and that was a sin. And Abram wants nothing to do with this. He's like, look, this was your idea. She's your servant. You do with her whatever you want. That's the continuation of a lack of guidance, a lack of leadership in Abram, uh, taking control of the situation and doing what is right. Instead, he says, I'm going to be hands off. I'm going to be passive. Sarah, you do whatever you want with her. And she deals harshly with Hagar, so much so that Hagar flees, runs away, wanting nothing to do with Abram or Sarai anymore. Now, we've been talking about Abram and his relationship with the Lord, how he has been following the Lord, how he is obedient to the Lord. And look at this example that they are setting. This is a terrible, terrible example of servants, of followers of God to someone from Egypt, who is not a follower of the Lord. And it shows us here that we are ambassadors. We are examples to other people in our lives of what God is like, who he is. And this is a bad example of following God. And what happens next is God intervenes. He says um, in in verse 7, The angel of the Lord found her, her is Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. So what's happening here is the angel of the Lord seeks out Hagar. God is seeking her. He is trying to find her, to encourage her, to help her as she is running away in the wilderness. And And the angel of the Lord tells her to return to her mistress and submit to her. Do what is right. Be humble. Be submissive. But know that I will bless you. Know that I will bless your son greatly, that he too will be numerous and will be a multitude. And then in verse 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So the name Ishmael that Hagar's son is going to have means that the Lord has listened to her affliction. And what's important to see here is that when Hagar was afflicted, when she was at her lowest point, the people that had been providing for her have pushed her out. And she is now in the wilderness, pregnant, alone, trying to provide for herself. And this is when God steps in at her Uh, darkest moment at her time of most need the Lord comes and it says that he has listened to her affliction and what we can take away from this is that this is true for us as well that when we are down and out when we are discouraged when we are depressed when we are going through hard times the Lord is listening to our affliction and he is there ready to help us And he wants us to call on him, to seek him, to ask for help. And he's willing and ready to encourage us, to give us help. And we see this primarily through the life of Jesus when the world as a whole, but also when you and when I and when every individual person was dead in our sin, 
the Lord saw and he heard our affliction and our sin and the penalty that we deserve for that. And he came and he intervened for us in our darkest moments. So the name Ishmael is actually a great and encouraging name that we should know today that the Lord is listening to us when we are afflicted, when we are going through hard times. And he is ready to act on our behalf, ready to encourage us if we would just turn to him and call on his name. And now Hagar is so encouraged by this. And she says in verse 13, so she, Hagar, called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Birloharoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. So I have to admit, I gave you guys a little bit of a trick question with El Roy. It's the Hebrew for you are a God of seeing. Hagar calls God El Roy. And this word Roy means seeing, but it's not just literal physical sight. It's understanding, it's knowledge, it's perception. And what it's saying is that in her deepest, darkest moments, God understood her. And again, this brings us to Christ who died a brutal death on the cross, suffered for us, that when we are suffering, Jesus understands. He doesn't just see our suffering and say, that stinks, I, I should do something about it. But he actually understands. He knows what it's like to go through suffering and go through difficulties. And so that's why we can be encouraged to turn to him when we are going through hard times, when we are struggling, uh, when we have difficulties in our life. So this is the encouragement we get from the names Ishmael and El Roy, that God listens in our afflictions and he understands our sufferings. And now we see Abram, this character we've been looking at, we see his name now change to Abraham. And I'm so thankful for this because this whole time I've been reading Abram, I've wanted to say Abraham, but I've been trying to be disciplined. It's Abram, but now he's finally going to be called Abraham. And we see this in chapter 17, verse 1. It says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you. And may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. If you remember last week, Genesis chapter 15, the big idea was that God made his covenant with Abram, that Abram split the animal sacrifices in half and that God walked through establishing his covenant with Abram, but saying, I am taking the penalty if this covenant is broken on myself. God takes the penalty of a broken covenant on himself. But now what's this? God says to Abram, be blameless. Walk before me, be blameless, that I may make my covenant between you. God, I thought you already made your covenant. What is happening here? Um, and what I want to encourage us to see is that this isn't two separate ideas. This isn't two separate covenants. It's one idea showing two different aspects to the covenant. The big idea from last week is that salvation, forgiveness of sins in breaking the covenant comes only through God and through his sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And this is what we often talk about with the idea of election regarding salvation, that our salvation comes 100% by the work of God. We cannot do anything to add to our salvation. It is by the work of Christ alone. And then once we are saved, we are covenanted to the Lord and we commit to following him and being obedient to him. It's not that we are saved by God's power alone, so we do whatever we want and we live under that power. No, we live under that power and we live obediently to God. This is what God is talking about here. He says, walk before me, be blameless, be obedient. Now that I have made my covenant with you, the other side of the covenant is obedience. Be obedient. And then in verse five, we get to 
the name change. God says, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into a nation, into nations, and kings shall come from you. Okay, so now his name is changed. Why at this moment, why is this the time that Abraham or Abram's name is changed to Abraham? It's because now he has a new identity. And this is something we see throughout all of scripture, um, especially in the New Testament. The most popular example is Saul, who has a, a meeting with God on the road to Damascus. And then later his name is changed to Paul. But here what's happening is that Abram is the name that he was given and it is of the old him. But now that he is covenanted with the Lord, he has a relationship and he is striving to live in obedience to the Lord. He is given a new name representing his new identity, his new identity as one of God's children, a follower of God. And so this new name represents a new identity. He is now the Lord's. That's why the name change happens here. And it, the change actually resembles the blessing. It's a reminder of the blessing that God had given him. Uh, the name Abram means highly exalted father or a, a good father. The name Abraham means a good father of many nations. And this is the blessing that God gives him. I will make you a father of a multitude of nations. His name means this as a constant reminder of the promise that God has given him. And it continues in verse seven. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is again the prophecy or the blessing that we saw last week in chapter 15. But what it's saying is this covenant, what does this covenant look like? What does it mean? What does it represent? It represents that God is Abram, Abraham's God and the God of his descendants and that his descendants will worship the Lord as God. And this is the same thing that happens to us when we uh, put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. What we're saying is that we recognize that Jesus is God and that he is Lord over us. And we are covenanting to worshiping him and following him as God over us. So this is the encouragement that we get from the changing of the name Abram to Abraham, that when we are in Christ, we have a new identity as sons and daughters of God, that we are his, that we follow him, and we strive to live in obedience to him. Now we get to Sarai, having her name changed to Sarah. This is much easier for me to pronounce, because I know a whole lot more Sarahs than I do Sarai's, but... Um, Sarai to Sarah, what is happening here? And this is, is picked up in verse 15. It says, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings and people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? So the name change is very small here. It's one letter difference. Um, but what's happening is actually a huge change. The name Sarai means princess, but it also means contentious. Uh, so a contentious princess. Uh, but the name Sarah is actually a greater position. It's a commander of an army. It's a f female queen, we might say. Um, but it's a highly exalted 
princess. And what it's saying is that she is no longer going to be contentious like we just saw with happening with the story of Hagar. She's not going to be this contentious pr princess. Now she's going to be a leader. She's going to be a queen. She's going to be a powerful nation that's going to come from her. And Abram's response, now that we have this information, is very rational. He's like, I'm 100 years old. She's 90 years old. How is this going to happen? Um, but what's interesting here is that when Abram is thinking about this, uh, Abraham is thinking about this, he calls her by her new name, Sarah, not Sarai. So even in his questioning, there is a little bit of faith and trust that this will happen because he's saying, all right, God, you said her na new name is Sarah. I'm going to call her by that. And th even in his doubts, there is still a hint of belief. Um, and this is an encouragement to us as well. Being a Christian, being a follower of God doesn't mean we never have doubts, doesn't mean we never have questions, or we never think things might be so beyond our belief that it might seem insane to us. But what it means is that when we have doubts, when we have questions, that we still believe and we still trust in the Lord. Um, and Abraham pushes, Abraham pushes back a little bit more in verse, verse 18. Uh, and Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. So what's happening here is Abraham's like, God, why can't Ishmael be the son of promise? Why can't he just be the one to fulfill your covenant? And God says, no, because I want you to know that I am the one who is doing this. You took matters into your own hand to try and bring about my will, but I'm telling you, and I told you before, you are going to have a son of promise, of blessing, and his name is going to be Isaac, and it's going to be through Sarah, your wife, because I, the Lord God, am the one who is doing this for you. And this is a powerful challenge to us and encouragement, but do we ever try to force God's hand or do we ever try and bring about the will of God in our own way apart from seeking God himself, right? There might be times in our life where we know what God's will for our life is and then we take any measures possible to bring it about, but we don't seek the Lord in the process. We don't seek God in knowing how to bring about his will and when we do that, it leads to mistakes. It leads to wrongdoings. What we ultimately need to do in order to continually be in alignment with the will of God is to constantly seek him, to constantly trust his guidance and his words and the things that he tells us. But even still, God still remembers Ishmael as we saw earlier. And it continues in verse 20 saying, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with, with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you th at this time next year. God's saying, I have not forgotten Ishmael. I've still blessed him. However, my covenant is with Isaac specifically through Sarah. Sarah will be the leader of my people through this covenant. And this is the encouragement we get from the change of name from Sarai to Sarah is that we no longer need to rebel or be contentious with the will of God, but we can seek him, submit to his will and allow him to use us to bring about his will into the earth. For Sarah, it was to lead the nation that God would establish his covenant with. For us, it'll look like different things, but are we submitting to his will? Are we trusting him with his plan for our lives or are we being contentious? So with all of these things, there's so many different things that we can think about with all of the different names here, but what it ultimately boils down to is that the Lord is with us are we willing to follow him? Are we willing to seek him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father,
Lord, you are good and we praise you that when we are suffering and when we are down, that you are there with us, encouraging us and that you see us, but you also understand what we are going through. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the work of Christ that he can relate to us in our sufferings because he has suffered more than any of us ever will. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you are still guiding us and you are still leading us in our lives. We just ask that you give us the strength to turn to you. Help us embrace the new identity that we have as Christians in following you, that we will submit and love you and strive to be more and more like Christ. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for everything you are doing in our lives. We ask that we strive to glorify you in all that we do. Through Jesus' name, your son, we pray. Amen.